Today I've got a video about the Euler Mascheroni constant. And so this is one of the other constants out there that is related to the famous mathematician Euler. And this one comes from 1790, which oddly enough is also my birth year. Okay, so this thing is generally defined as the following limit. Oh, and also it's given the name gamma. So gamma is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 half plus 1 third all the way up to 1 over n minus the natural log of n. So notice that this is the nth partial sum of the harmonic series and obviously this is the logarithm. So this really ties together those two ideas. Partial sums of the harmonic series and logarithms, they're really related to each other. In fact, one is somewhat of a discrete version of the other. Okay, so the result that we're going to look at today comes from this paper of Jay Sondow, which is called an anti-symmetric formula for Euler's constant. And we will show that gamma is in fact equal to the limit as x goes to 1 from above of the sum as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the x minus 1 over x to the n. And that's the really nice anti-symmetric thing here. By anti-symmetric, we mean if we swap n and x, we just pick up a minus sign. Okay, so let's see how this might go. So the first thing that we'll do is a very, very simple calculation. And that is, let's notice that we have the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of n minus the natural log of n plus 1 is the same thing as the limit as n goes to infinity of the natural log of n over n plus 1, simply by logarithm rules. But then because the natural log is a continuous function, this is the natural log of 1 because that's what's happening inside of the natural log there as we let n go to infinity. But the natural log of 1 is equal to 0. But this tells us that we can replace this natural log of n right here with the natural log of n plus 1. And so let's just do that. So let's start here with gamma. And then we're gonna write this as the limit as, I'm gonna call it capital N at this point because we're gonna switch between capital N and lowercase n to build our final formula. Okay, so anyway, the limit as capital N goes to infinity of one plus one half plus one third ending at one over capital N and now minus the natural log of capital N plus one which, like I just said, we're able to use that log of n plus one because of this observation up here. And now we're gonna manipulate this object until it turns into this. Okay, so the first thing that we're gonna do is fairly straightforward. So I'm gonna write most of it the same. So I'll still have this sum right here and it ends at one over n just like it did before. But now I'm gonna write this natural log of n plus one as an integral. So this is like fairly obviously equal to the integral from one up to n plus one of one over t dt. Because if we take the integral of one over t, we get the natural log of t, then we evaluate at the upper end point giving us that and the lower end point will give us simply zero. And so now I'm going to use the following observation and maybe I'll just kind of branch this off into this pink box over here. And that is if we have the integral from one to n plus one of something, maybe I'll just put a box here. That's the same thing as the integral from one to two plus the integral from two to three all the way up to the integral from n to n plus one. That's just splitting this interval from 1 to n plus 1 into pieces. Okay, so now that motivates us to have the following rewriting. So we have the limit as n goes to infinity. Now I'll write this first one as the sum as little n goes from 1 to capital N of 1 over little n. So that's kind of clearly those first things. And then we'll have minus the sum as little n goes from one to capital N 
of the integral from little n to little n plus 1 of 1 over t dt. So I think that's looking pretty good. That captures this first bit as well as that second bit. Okay, but now since those sums are over the same ranges, I can really just push those two sums together. That leaves me with the limit as capital N goes to infinity of, now I have the sum as N goes from one to capital N of one over N minus the integral from n to n plus one of one over t dt. Okay, good. So I think that is looking pretty good. Okay, so now let's maybe start a fresh board from this step. So this is where we just ended up. But notice so far, there's nothing having to do with this limit as x goes to one from above. So I'm gonna sneak that in the middle right here. So I'll still have this limit as capital N goes to infinity, but now inside of that will be the limit as X goes to one from above. And then I can maybe go ahead and just put that finite sum inside because it's no problem at all because it's a finite sum. So we've got the sum as N goes from one to capital N of one over N to the X. So as X goes to one, that clearly just goes to one over N and then minus the integral from n to n plus one of one over t to the x dt. And then again, as x goes to one, that goes to one over t, so that's good. And now we're gonna exchange the order of our limits and we'll prove why that is okay, maybe towards the end of this video. So I'll just put a little star right here that we will check that this is okay. We'll use something called the Weierstrass M test. Okay, so exchanging the order of our limits, we have the limit as x goes to one from above, and now we'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity. Because if we let n approach infinity here, that will obviously change the upper bound to infinity. And then we have one over n to the x minus the integral from n to n plus one. And then I'm gonna write this one over t to the x as t to the minus x dt. Okay, good. But now notice in our region, we have x is strictly bigger than one. That's because we're letting x approach one from above. So keeping that in mind, that means that the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the x converges absolutely. And then this object you can check will also converge absolutely. So that means we can split this into two sums, and that's exactly what we'll do. So now we have the limit as x goes to one from above. We'll have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the x. That'll be our first sum. And then, well, that sum from n going from one to infinity of all of these will simply give us an improper integral. And that improper integral will be the integral from one to infinity of t to the minus x dx. And then let's make sure we know that's all inside of this limit. And now let's do a little bit of a side calculation on this integral so we can get a feel for what it looks like. So let's take the antiderivative, so that means we need to increase the exponent by one, that gives us a one minus x, divide by the new exponent, that'll be one minus x, and now we have to evaluate that from t equals one up to t approaching infinity. Well, check it out. If we let t approach infinity, since x here is bigger than one and we have t to the one minus x, that means that this exponent right here is most definitely negative. But since that exponent is negative, as t goes to infinity, that bit will go to zero. But then we plug in t equals one and we simply get one, meaning that this is equal to minus one over one minus x. So, and the minus sign in the numerator comes from the fact that that's our lower bound of integration or our lower bound of evaluation. Okay, so let's maybe write this one more time before we move on. We've got the limit as x goes to one from above. And now we have this sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the x minus the 
sum of one over x minus one. So I think we've got just a couple steps left. So here we are. And one thing that's really important to point out is that this one over x minus one is not part of the sum. It is outside of the sum, but it's inside of the limit. That being said, we somehow want to turn it into a sum that we can combine with what we have here. So how might we do that? Well, let's take this thing over to the side and we'll do our side calculation. And I've got my little reminder up here that we know that x is bigger than one. Okay, so I'm gonna start by factoring an x out of the denominator. So that allows me to write one over x minus one as one over x times one over one minus one over x. So something that looks like that. Okay, but now since x is bigger than one, that means one over x is less than one. But if one over x is less than one, then we're within the radius of convergence for a geometric series where we think about one over x as being the variable. So that's exactly what we'll do. We'll take this object right here and expand it as a geometric series in one over x. So that'll give us the one over x times the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of one over x to the n. But then we can bring this one over x in and we have the sum as n goes from zero to infinity of one over x to the n plus one. But then we can just re-index that to start at one. And that's exactly what we'll do for this next step. So now I have the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over x to the n. Now I think you can see where we're at. Now we can just push these together and we'll have our limit as x goes to zero from above of the sum as n goes from one to infinity of one over n to the x minus one over x to the n. But looking over here, that's exactly where we wanted to end up. But maybe you guys remember that we did something sketchy at one point where we exchanged two limits or a limit and a summation. Now we'd like to talk about why we're able to do that. So the Weierstrass M test says that if we have a sequence of functions f sub n, where the absolute value of f sub n evaluated at x is less than or equal to a number m sub n for all natural numbers n and for all x from some set a, and the sum as n goes from one to infinity of m sub n converges, then the sum as n goes from one to infinity of f sub n evaluated at x, where x comes from a, converges absolutely and uniformly. But the uniform convergence is the important he thing here, because uniform convergence means that we can exchange the order of, well, summation and a limit, or maybe two limits or anything like that. Okay, so now let's apply this test to our setup. And we can do that with a string of inequalities. So let's start with zero at the bottom, but zero is less than one over n to the x minus the integral from n to n plus one of one over t to the x dx. So I don't think that's too hard to check. And that's the stage we were at when we did that exchange of limits. But now we can put these two things together. We can just put an integral on that because the length of the interval here is one. So now we've got that's equal to the integral from n to n plus one of one over n to the x minus one over t to the x dx. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. And then from there, we can turn that into a double integral. Maybe I'll leave the details a little bit as a homework exercise, but what we end up with is this is the same thing as the double integral, starting from n to n plus one, and then the inner integral goes from n up to t, and now we have x times u to the minus x minus one, and this is gonna be du dt. But now we'll bound this function above by x times n to the minus x minus one. So it's clear that we bound it above by that because since we have a negative exponent here, it'll achieve the maximum down here. 
So that means this is less than or equal to x times n to the minus x minus 1, and then that double integral just over du dt, where we have those same bounds of integration, but maybe I won't write those out. Okay, but then it's easy to check that this is gonna give us one half times x times n to the minus x minus one. And that's simply because this term right here represents the area of a triangle with the two side lengths of one. I guess it's a right triangle, I should say. But this whole thing is less than or equal to one over n squared. But the sum of one over n squared converges you know, that's a famous P-series test. So that means our thing converges absolutely and uniformly, which means it totally was legit to exchange the order of those limits. Okay, so thanks for sticking around if you're still around. Maybe consider subscribing to the channel. It would really help us out. That's of course if you haven't subscribed yet. And that's a good place to stop. Thanks for watching and sticking around until the end of the video. And since you're here, don't forget to gently press that like button. Subscribe, ring the bell, and select all notifications to never miss a video. If you want to get your name in the credits like you see here, access the live seminar series, review videos before release, and more, go to patreon.com slash michaelpenmath and become a Patreon member today. If you want full ad-free course content, subscribe to my second channel, Math Major. I've got courses on linear algebra, complex analysis, and proof writing, among several others. And that's everything. Bye.